Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Hello there. This is your host, D, and welcome to episode four of the Benzo Free Podcast. I'm so glad you joined me today. It's now mid-January as I'm recording this session. As usual, I'm in my fort in the basement. It's, it's a term I use for my makeshift recording studio. It's actually just a table for my laptop, a chair, several cymbal stands holding up some flannel sheets for acoustics, and, and my trusty chai tea next to me. That's my recording studio. Today's episode will follow the normal format. As usual, we'll start out with the introduction, which is where we are now, followed by Q&A, our feature, and wind up with a moment of peace. Today's feature is actually part two of our three-part series called Managing the Fear. If you haven't heard part one of the series, you might want to listen to episode three of the podcast before this one. Please keep in mind that this podcast is only as good as the feedback we receive, so don't forget to let us know what you think. Any suggestions, additions, changes, complete rewrites, whatever information you can provide is welcome. I really want to hear from you. So please don't forget to log on to our website at benzofree.org slash feedback or send us an email at podcast at benzofree.org. I can't wait to hear from you. And before we move on, just keep in mind that the Benzo Free Podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. The first question today is right off the benzo boards, and that is, I am taking Xanax on occasion, periodically. Am I addicted? Hopefully not. First off, I'm going to talk more about dependence here than addiction, even though they often go hand in hand. If you need more clarity, please check out the book. I go into a lot of detail about the difference between the two. But since most of our concerns are actually about the physical dependence of these drugs, that's what we're going to talk about here. Most governments and medical associations recommend benzos for short-term use only, and they warn against use longer than two to four weeks. Now, that's a good benchmark to keep in mind. This is kind of a standard number that I see across a lot of different sources. Now, I have heard stories of people becoming dependent in as little as 11 days of continuous use, although those are probably extreme cases. The truth is, everyone is different, and we really don't know how long a specific person can take the drug without becoming dependent. But even if you are not dependent on the drug and only taking the benzos on occasion, remember that there are plenty of side effects with benzos which should also be of concern, and you need to know these and look into them to make sure that you're working around these side effects. If you're concerned at all about the drugs you are taking, please talk with your doctor and see if there's another treatment option for you if you'd like to change. That's between you and your doctor. Okay, let's move on to question two. You are over four years benzo-free. Are you finally symptom-free? Are, are you back to normal? This might be the most common question I receive hands down, and, and it makes sense. Those who are in the throes of serious benzo withdrawal just want to know that they will heal completely eventually. They want to get back to a normal life. They want hope, any hope they can cling to. And they will reach out to those of us who have survived this gauntlet of withdrawal to find out what it is like. I did the same thing. This is what we do. I so badly want to tell these people that, yes, I am symptom-free, and yes, I have returned to a normal life. I so ache to say that each and every time because I know what's what they want to hear. But I can't tell them that. I can't lie. It wouldn't be right and it wouldn't be fair. Perhaps the problem in these situations is more the question than the answer. Perhaps a better question is not, am I symptom-free, which I'm not. 
Or perhaps it's not, have I returned to a normal life, which isn't even a question I know how to answer. I mean, what is a normal life? And is a normal life the best life for me? You know, perhaps the better question I think I would ask in hindsight is, how are you doing? How are you? I think that's the better question, because it's all relative. To answer that question, I would just say, I am good. Yes, I still have symptoms. Yes, I am still limited in my career due to cognitive and anxiety issues. And yes, there are days I let this whole thing that happened to me get the better of me. And those days suck. I got to be honest, this is true. You know, it's, it's funny, and this sounds like a negative thing, but it's not. The truth is, benzo withdrawal lowered the bar of my expectations in life. And I know that sounds bad, but I don't see it that way. It's, it, it's funny. It's all about perspective. I still have dreams of what I want to accomplish and experience. But at the same time, I get more enjoyment out of the little things now. An evening reading in front of the fire with my wife and dog is wonderful. A long walk at twilight, watching my nephew's baseball game, or listening to my niece play the piano, or writing my book. Sure, there's a lot more out there in life, and perhaps I'll get to experience some of it in the coming years, but I've been to hell and back through Benzo withdrawal, and that perspective has made my life look damn good right now. I know it's hard to understand this, but this is the truth. I get more enjoyment out of these things around me. These things that I ignored in the past that I thought weren't all that important are now important. I also found some other benefits going through withdrawal. I mean, I lost weight and became a much healthier eater. I now exercise more. I enjoy a more active lifestyle. I don't worry as much about the little aches and pains that I feel along the way. I now dream and I can enjoy the luxury of an occasional seven-hour night's sleep, which is amazing when you haven't had one in such a long time. I now feel. That's a big one. I feel. I have emotions. For 12 years, Clonopin suppressed my emotions. And I didn't have to feel anything. And I didn't feel much. But now suddenly these emotions are coming, rushing back, and they are powerful, and they scare the hell out of you. But I'm learning slowly to embrace them, to realize they're okay. They're just emotions, something that most of the other people deal with all the time, but that I haven't had to for years. And learning to handle those emotions is a difficult road back. But once you learn not to be scared of them and learn to embrace them and realize they're just part of being human, there might be a better life with these emotions. I now feel better. I'm a better husband because I feel more. I'm a better son because I feel more. It's not a bad thing. It's a hard thing to adapt to, but it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. So let's close that Q&A out and let's move on to our feature. Our feature today is part two of Managing the Fear. That's part two of a three-part series we started last episode. We're discussing five key areas of focus in this section, and these areas of focus are responsibility, positivity, activity, kindness, and acceptance. We covered responsibility in last week's episode. Today we're covering positivity and activity, and next episode we'll cover kindness and acceptance. These are actually based off of a chapter in the book by the same name, so if you want more detail on this section, please feel free to check out the book. And don't forget, for those of you who have not started withdrawal yet, that the odds are in your favor. Only 45% of long-term users will have a difficult withdrawal. And only 10 to 15% will have protracted withdrawal lasting 18 months or longer beyond your last dose. So please keep these numbers in mind when you hear difficulties or horror stories from other people. The vast majority of these are not something you specifically will go through. So it's better to focus on your own issues and your own withdrawal. Get help, talk to other people, but don't take on their problems as if they are going to be yours because everybody's different and trust me, your experience is going to be different, okay? Today we're going to cover positivity and activity and let's start with positivity. This is not about necessarily always keeping positive. It, it's about allowing your feelings to happen, all feelings. That, that's critical to maintaining mental health. Feelings are valid. Suppressing them is never the answer. And what a positive mindset, which is what I'm talking about here, 
is about is not about suppressing your feelings or glossing over them or putting on a good face. That plan of attack will lead to disaster. What, what I'm talking about here is you'll still feel sad, angry, mad, everything else at different times. But when something happens in your life, you might just lean a little more on the positive side than the negative side. You know, the glass is half full. One of my favorite quotes is from actually one of my favorite writers, um, Richard Bach. In his book, Illusions, he said the following quote, Argue for your limitations, and sure enough, they're yours, end quote. I found that so true in my life. The more I focused on what I couldn't do, the more I focused on what I can't do or how bad I felt, then the less I can do. You know, it's, it's estimated that we have about 50,000 thoughts in the average day. That, that's a lot of thinking we do. I mean, I would say my number might be closer to 100,000 because I can't seem to stop my brain from obsessing and ruminating. But still, I'm probably closer to that average than I want to admit. And many of those thoughts, I mean, perhaps even most of them are actually distorted. They are. Our brains aren't that accurate. We're influenced by so many factors. Our senses perceive the outside world, but those messages go through a filter of habits, patterns, opinions, ideas, and stories before creating a final thought or emotion. And this has never been more true than during benzo withdrawal. Hopelessness is pervasive for many of us during this time, but it's not real. It's distorted. And that's really hard to get through to the brains of people that are in the middle of this. During withdrawal, more than any other time, we need to fight this false perspective that our lives are hopeless. Sure, our lives have changed dramatically, and for the most part, for the worse. I get that. I'm not denying that. But it's temporary. The way you feel during your worst days of withdrawal won't be the way you will feel later. You will get better, even if you don't fully heal, which most of us do. One of the best methods of changing your way of thinking is to learn to recognize negative thought patterns. Um, psychologists call these a variety of different names, such as mind reading, labeling, emotional reasoning, blaming, fortune telling. I'm a chronic overthinker. I'm guilty of every one of these distortions at one time or another, and I'm not alone. It's important when you're going through benzo withdrawal to notice these. Notice these things when they're happening in your mind, to identify them, and to work on solutions to change those. Another thing to remember is to enjoy life despite your current situation. It's, it's so funny. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times that I thought, well, I, I can't go out and do this, or I can't do this, or I can't enjoy this because I'm in the middle of this freaking withdrawal, and it's driving me nuts, and it's painful, and it hurts, and I can't think straight. I, I thought this all the time, but that was ridiculous. I would have joy that would come into my life, and I would almost block it out because, well, no, I can't enjoy that now because I'm in withdrawal. It's stupid. I can't tell you the number of times I did that and thought that. It's ridiculous. Enjoy life. Enjoy the little things that come along. Enjoy the positive things that come along. Focus on them. Embrace them. Hang on to them. I thought I would be fully recovered a long time ago, but I'm not. And it's possible I may never be. So honestly, should I wait until I am fully recovered to start enjoying life again? I don't think so. I need to enjoy it along the way. Celebrate the journey. Life is the journey, not the end game. The end game for all of us is the same. Life is finite. So shouldn't we be enjoying this journey that's in the middle? A perfect example of this was a quote I came across from Stephen Hawking. He, he passed away when I was writing this book. Here's a person who was diagnosed with ALS, a severe fatal disease in 1963 and given only a few years to live. Not only did he live for another 55 years, well into his 70s, but he thrived and became one of the greatest scientific minds of our time. He took this terribly debilitating disease and lived a full and productive life. He said, quote, my advice to other disabled people would be, Concentrate on things your disability doesn't prevent you doing well. And don't regret the things it interferes with. Don't be disabled in spirit as well as physically. End quote. I love that quote. It's so true. 
we so easily want to focus on our disabilities, especially in benzo withdrawal, when we should be focusing on the things we can still do. Noticing these patterns in yourself and working to change them is a significant first step towards reducing your worry and anxiety during withdrawal. Once you've identified them, you can start to change them. In the book, one of the questions, since my entire book is written in a Q&A format, one of the questions I ask is, but everything in the world is negative these days. How do you find something good to focus on? And I love that question because I think it is so utterly ridiculous. And yet it's a question I ask myself all the time. But it's stupid. It is ridiculous. Things are not so bad these days. And the only way to really counter this is to look at it scientifically. Look at the actual numbers, the actual statistics. In the 1300s, the bubonic plague wiped out one-third of the entire human race. That's right, one-third. We're talking two to three billion people by today's numbers. Today, we have either eradicated or significantly reduced the effects of polio, smallpox, tuberculosis, cholera, Spanish flu, bubonic plague. Not too long ago in our history, the average lifespan was in the 30s and 40s, and it's now in the 70s. In 1800, 88% of the world population was illiterate. In 2014, that number was less than 15%. Let's look at poverty. From 1981 to 2013, the global population living in absolute poverty dropped from 44% to less than 11%. We're making huge strides. Let's take a look at violent crime. From 1994 to 2014, the number of U.S. victims of violent crime per capita decreased by 75%. That's right, 75%. And yet most people believe crime is actually getting worse. It's not. It's so funny when you look at these numbers and you look over the last 20 years or so, you'll see the number of violent crimes going down on the graph while the people's opinion of violent crime going up. People think it's getting worse when it's not. Today we have access to air conditioning. Oh, I love that one. I love having air conditioning. We have airplanes. We can get to places in hours instead of days or weeks. We have automobiles, dishwashers, electricity, indoor plumbing. What a wonderful one. The internet, we use that like crazy. I'm using it right now for this podcast. Lawnmowers, microwave ovens, paved roads, radio, TV, video games. Tons of labor-saving, time-saving, life-saving, and pleasure-inducing inventions. And yet, we think life is worse. It's funny. Now, yes, you're in the middle of benzo withdrawal. I get it. This sucks. Okay, but when you're trying to find some positive things to focus on to help you get through it, there are plenty of those things to focus on. We worry so much about how bad the world has become when, by most measurements, the exact opposite is true. These are incredibly positive trends. So when you're looking for something to focus on and you can't seem to find anything, remember these numbers. Remember these statistics. This is a pretty good world to live in. Once you get past this withdrawal, things are looking up. So hang in there. And our next key area of focus we're covering today is activity. And by this, I mean both an active mind and active body. Both of these are key, in my opinion, to successful withdrawal from benzodiazepines. Let's start out with an active mind. More and more studies show that keeping your mind active is key to keeping it healthy. This goes double for people with anxiety and triple for people going through benzo withdrawal. If you're currently working while you're in withdrawal, keep working if you can. Keeping yourself busy is so important. Keeping distractions, keeping your mind active on something. One of the worst things you can do is to sit home all day long and focus on your withdrawal. Nothing makes this process harder than that. Keep your mind busy as much as you can. I know some of us can't work. I couldn't work at times, but when I could, I did. And I'll tell you, I was happier when I was working than when I wasn't. Keeping your mind busy is one of the greatest secrets to managing benzo withdrawal. I occupy my mind with research. I research benzos to the nth degree. I, I focus on happiness. I research psychology on anxiety, insomnia, alternative treatments. I researched everything I could get my hands on about what I was going through. And all that became the basis for my book. 
It was great. It really worked out well. It kept my mind active and got me through it. And out of it, I came out with this book and this podcast and the website. It's all good. And being physically active is equally as important. There, there was a research study back in 2000 that evaluated three groups of patients who treated their major depression with medication, exercise, or a combination of the two. Although all three groups showed similar improvement early on, when tested six months later, the results were startling. The medication-only group had a 38% relapse rate. The combination group had a 31% relapse rate. But the exercise-only group had just a 9% relapse rate. Those who did just the exercise to help treat their depression did the best. And it doesn't take much. Studies have shown that the first 20 minutes of exercise garners the most health benefits. Just a little bit every day makes a huge difference. Don't let your body just go to waste while you're laying there and focusing on your withdrawal. Get up and do something. I walked every chance I could. That was a huge gain for me, was getting out and walking. I would also play the drums when I could. Um, I have a drum set in the basement, and this really helps me because this also not only helps me to get the exercise, but also it works out some of my inner demons. I can beat the heck out of the skins, and it, and it makes me feel better. I would also go to the gym and work on the elliptical or go with friends and, and play outside if I could, or with my niece and nephew, go play outside. Do what I can. Now, now this it's also real important to, to listen to our bodies. I'm not telling you to do this. I'm telling you what I did. But it's important for us to listen to our bodies and not push it. I mean, benzos are very strong muscle relaxants, most of them. And when you come off of them, like I did, your muscles lock up. So there are limitations in what you can do. So listen to your body and just do what you can do. Don't push yourself. That is important because you wind up, as I did, tearing muscles, pulling muscles, a lot of aches and strains and sprains. And I did that plenty. I was in and out of PT several times. These are critical to your recovery in my mind. And there's things that helped me get through this. So I wanted to share them with you today. So that's it for today's feature. Um, check out episode five next, which will cover kindness and acceptance. I hope those will be just as interesting to you as they are to me, and as hopefully the rest of them have been. And that means we're going to move on to our closing. And before we get too far, please bear with me for about 25 seconds for our short disclaimer. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical health or psychological advice, nor any other kind of personal or professional services. Withdrawal, tapering, or any change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, theanodiazepines, or any other prescription drug should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. Okay, and that brings us to our closing, and our closing each episode is what I call our moment of peace. It's, it just takes about a minute. It's an opportunity to quiet your mind a bit before you return to the chaos of the real world out there. The way this works is that I will give you a brief introduction, perhaps a suggestion of something to focus on. Then I will play a soft bell, which will indicate the start of the one minute. This will be followed by another soft bell, which will indicate the end of the one minute. And that will be the end of the episode. Please feel free to continue to meditate if you choose. If not, continue on with your day. I do want to remind you that should you do this exercise, please only do it in a safe space. If you are driving, operating heavy machinery, or any place that is not safe to close your eyes and meditate, then please skip this closing and wait until you are in a safe location. So let's get started. Today's suggestion is going to be simple, and it's going to be the mantra, let go, let God. For those of you who have faith in a supreme being of any type, this can be a very effective mantra. It, it helps you let go of the stress of trying to control everything, and remember that God, God has this. And if you don't believe in a supreme being, no problem. Feel free to do the breathing, listening, or counting meditations from the previous episodes or substitute your own mantra. Perhaps something like, everything is okay, or I can handle anything that comes my way. Find something that speaks to you. Let's start by taking a deep breath. Close your eyes and take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly. 
Let's do that again. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let it out slowly. And along with it, let out all the stress of the day. One more time. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let it out as you release all the stress from your body. Now just breathe normally. In and out. In and out. Just slowly. And as you do, say your mantra in your mind just to yourself. Something like, let go, let God, or whatever mantra you choose to use today. Now if your mind wanders, remember, just gently bring it back to focus on your mantra. No judgment. There's no rules here. Just keep doing that. It's that simple. Continue to do this for one minute. Thank you for joining me today, and before you leave, remember, be kind to yourself, to those you love, to everyone. Have a great day.